Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to learn about line spectra and Bohr's model. I recommend that you pause the video and read over the learning objectives so you have a better under understanding of what we'll be doing today. So let's talk about what line spectra are. First, it's important to understand that different types of light sources will produce different spectra. And we can have what are called continuous, discrete or line spectra, and monochr monochromatic spectra. If you have a light source, um, like a light bulb, or the sun, or any kind of, let's call this a heated substance typically will have some solid phase materials in them. Then that's going to give us what we call a continuous spectrum and it has all visible frequencies. And there are some exceptions to that. When you look at the spectrum of the sun, it has these black lines that are called Fraunhofer lines. And these are due to the absorption of light by various elements that are in the atmosphere of the sun. But most heated substances will refer to these as black bodies emit a continuous spectrum. Then you have line or discrete spectra and these are caused when you have a single element and it's in its gas phase. And finally, you have uh, sources like lasers, and they produce, produce monochromatic light, or light of a single wavelength. One of the objectives after today is that you're able to recognize is a substance, uh, is it a continuous source, or is it a discrete source, and what might that discrete source be? So let's take a look at different elements. When you take a helium or a hydrogen discharge tube, it might look something like this. It kind of has a pink purplish glow. But when you take it and you put it through a prism, it splits up into component colors and very specific colors. Hydrogen has four colors that it splits up into. Helium has about six that are in the visible spectrum. And then neon has upwards to 20 or so. And you'll see that different elements have different spectra and that are unique to them. What causes these differences are both the number of electrons and the number of protons within the nucleus and the size of the element. So we're not going to go into the details of all of the different elements, but what you want to be able to recognize in addition to a continuous spectrum is that you have relatively simple cases of spectra that are involved with small, simple elements, and then larger elements tend to have more complicated spectra. And the first learning objective of today that's listed back on the first page is exactly this, recognizing that Larger elements in general have more complicated spectra. Smaller elements in general have less complicated spectra. And then if you have some a what we call a black body, this could be the sun, this could be a heated lamp, this might even be the, uh, the element, the heating element of your stove. Those have essentially continuous spectra that have all of the colors and you can't really differentiate between from one color to the next. So why do they have this unique spectra? As we talked about before, hydrogen has four um, visible lines that we see. 
And it turns out that there we can quantify them. We can measure those wavelengths and we can relate them to what we call energy states or the principal quantum number n. And we're going to look at this more in detail. But essentially what we what we see is that it's related to the energy levels within an element. And we're going to look at the Bohr model right now to see where this comes from. So the Bohr model explains perfectly hydrogen's line spectrum. Bohr, Niels Bohr essentially talked about how he said that elements have the nucleus in the center and electrons that are orbiting. Think of how the Earth orbits the Sun, going around in a never-ending circle, essentially. Uh, in this case, these are perfectly circular orbits. And only certain distances or radii are allowed. So the electron could rotate around here at this n equals 1 level or the n equals 2 level, but you can never have a non-integer number. You can't have 1.5 or 1.65. It's just not possible. He called this the principal quantum number, and we'll come back to more quantum numbers later. And he also said that energy is absorbed or emitted only when we move from one orbit to the next. So there's no energy lost as it rotates. Only if it, go, if it absorbs energy, it goes up from one energy level to the next, or if it goes down energy levels, then it gives off energy. We, looked, we saw this relationship, that energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency, or that it's equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light over the wavelength. And so the energy of, of each transition is dependent upon the wavelength of light, the color of light that it absorbs. And the caveat here is that the Bohr, Bohr model only applies to elements with one electron. It doesn't work very well once we start looking at multiple electron elements. And in later chemistry classes, you'll learn about other methods that are used to calculate the energies involved with those. Some important terminology and other ideas here. We talked about how you can have n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, etc but not n equals 1.3, 1.5, 1.9, etc. And that means that we have discrete or quantized energy levels. It's kind of like when you are going up steps. You can go up one step or two steps, but you can't go up a half of a step or three quarters of a step. It's not possible. Elements and their electrons behave the same way. And these result in what are called electronic transitions. And that's electrons moving from one energy state to another. In the case of them going down in energy, that's an emission. Going up in energy is an absorption. And two other terms here that you want to be familiar with are the ground state and the excited states. And notice that there are essentially an infinite number of excited states, whereas there's only one ground state. We can talk about electrons in their orbits and relate it to Coulomb's law. Remember when we looked at Coulomb's law, we said that the energy is proportional to the product of their charges over the distance between them. And with, within the Bohr model, it follows the same pattern. As the distance to the nucleus increases, the energy also increases. As the distance decreases, the energy also decreases. Something that's important to recognize within Coulomb's law is that energies involving electrons attracted to protons are always negative. And that stems from the idea that we have a negative charge for electrons and a positive charge for protons. And so the product of a negative and a positive is always going to be negative. So when we look at an, an increase in the distance, the magnitude of our energy goes down, but we're looking at a negative energy. So we might go something like negative 1, 
negative one half, negative one fourth, etc. And so the values are going to approach zero as the distance gets larger. We also know that when we, because of the attractions and repulsions, that when we put an electron into an orbit, if you take an electron and you put it in an orbit surrounding a nucleus, that that's an attractive interaction. And that releases energy. The way I like to remember this is like if you have a couple and they're attracted to each other, then we sometimes say that, you know, sparks are flying if they have a really great relationship. And so I think of seeing sparks flying as releasing energy. And so anytime you have an attractive interaction, that's going to release energy. If you want to break an interaction, then that's going to require energy. So in the same way, it, it, it takes someone coming in and, and working hard to destroy their relationship, some observer, in order to break that attractive relationship between that couple. And so that's going to require energy. We saw this relationship that in this specific case, similar to Coulomb's law, that energy is inversely proportional to distance, that it turns out that it's not just distance, but it's, it's the energy level squared. And I'm not going to go into the details of why that's the case. There's an excellent explanation of that within the ebook on one of the side pages in uh, section 2.2, I believe. However, the importance of this is that because it's to the n squared, that our energy levels are not spaced evenly. And what that means then is that even though we go the same change in n value, the change in energy from 2 to 3 is different. It's less than the change in energy from 1 to 2. And knowing that, that allows us to account for the difference in line spectra so much easier. We're going to use this idea to be able to make qualitative comparisons between energy changes. And so it's as simple as looking at the distance between the lines. If you've drawn it roughly to scale, then the distance between the energy levels is going to decrease as we go up which means that the energy difference will also decrease as we go up. When we look at this, we've already talked a little bit about the ground state. And just to remind you that the ground state is equal to n equals 1. And we also have what we call ionization, or the ionized state. And that is essentially a super excited state. And what you've done is you've taken and you've removed the electron from the nucleus. Well, how far is far enough away from the nucleus so that it's removed? Well, an infinite distance away is far enough away. And so we would say that the n level for an ionized electron is n equals infinity. OK, let's try a couple practice problems. So we have a hydrogen atom, and it's undergoing some electronic transitions. We want to know which of the following transitions will result in a light emission of the longest wavelength. What I would recommend that you do when st solving problems like this is start by drawing out that diagram that we saw earlier. Draw it as much to scale as you can. The most important things are is that the distance between the energy levels Get smaller as we go up. Okay? And so if we were to plot each of these transitions, transition A, 
is from n equals 1 to n equals 3. B is from n equals 6 to n equals 2. C is the reverse. D is from n equals 2 to n equals 1. And then E is from n equals 10, which is not shown, but we could approximate, knowing that it's somewhere between 6 and infinity, down to n equals 2. Now, how do we solve this? Well, you want to remember that we can relate energy both to frequency and to wavelength. And keeping that in mind, we know that the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. And we're looking for the transition with the longest wavelength. So that should mean we want the lowest energy. We also know that we're looking for an emission. An emission is when it's going, it's releasing energy. Our electron is going from high to low states. So we're looking at the red arrows. So we're looking at the red arrows. We're looking for the longest wavelength or the lowest energy. And that would correspond to then the shortest red arrow or transition B. There's one more problem for us to go through together, but I'd like you to pause it first and try it out on your own before you take a look at the solution. Welcome back. So how do we solve this type of a problem? Well, it's very similar to what we saw before, except this is a quantitative version. We can't just look at the energy levels. We need to actually use the Rydberg equation to solve for this. So the Rydberg equation is what was given, it's given to you on your data sheet. It relates the change in energy of any transition to the actual energy levels themselves, our initial and our final. We have a constant here. This is called the Rydberg constant. And it would be given to you. Let's try that again. Rydberg constant. We also know that the energy is proportional to the frequency and inversely proportional to the wavelength. Now, why did I put those up there? Well, we know that we're dealing with a wavelength. We know that we're dealing with the transitions. And so Rydberg equation makes me think of transitions. These equations make me think of energy and frequency and wavelength. If I combine these two equations, I'm going and combine them with the Rydberg equation, we can see that we can relate the wavelength directly to the transition levels. Next, you would look up the constants that you need to use. These are given to you on your data sheet. And you'd convert from your wavelength from nanometers to meters. The reason for this is if you take a look at your speed of light, your units are in meters whereas your wavelength here was in nanometers, and so you need to have those have the same prefix. We can then plug in all of those values. This is our value for h, c, lambda. This is our y. And then I've plugged in infinity here. Now, where did that come from? Well, we saw up here that our substance is ionized. And we talked about a couple slides ago that when it's ionized, n is equal to infinity. But how do you actually plug that into a calculator? You, you can't really. But what you should recognize is that as the, if we were to just look at this in terms of 1 over x, as x gets larger, what happens to the function? Let's just say y equals 1 over x. As x gets larger, y gets smaller. And once x is large enough, y, in fact, approaches 0. And so this term essentially is 0. When we then, if we divide by our Rydberg constant over on this side, we can get this following relationship, and then good old-fashioned algebra will help you to solve for your n value. And in this case, we see that n equals 1, or this is the ground state. If you struggled with this question, 
or have any other questions about the this lecture, please ask on Piazza or come to office hours. Thanks for watching and have a great day.